So what I'm going to do today is, is talk a little bit through cognitive services. I'm going to show you a little demo, show you a little code, and then we're going to um, mainly focus on the vision and speech capabilities today. So, um, But if you have questions on any of the other areas, please feel free to let me know. I'm happy to share on those as well. Okay, so here's kind of the all up look at the cognitive services. We have, oh, I think it's 30 different cognitive services right now. So this kind of suite of tools and what these all are, are APIs that are up in the cloud that you can take advantage of uh, pre-built models. You just basically call a REST endpoint, so it can be any language, uh, and then get this kind of treasure trove of information back. And I'm gonna show you the JSON in just a little bit and examples of some of the things that you can get. But we have a lot of things around vision, um, and spe you know specifically recognizing face, recognizing object. This is a computer. This is a podium, etc. Um, speech. So uh, being able to recognize, um, do text to speech and speech to text, obviously, and then things like speaker recognition. So being able to uh, understand in a conversation that this is Jennifer Mersman speaking and this is someone else speaking. Um, language, so being able to understand language and natural language, how people express themselves instead of typing in, you know, CP, you know, this source file, destination file, being able to say, I want to move this here to there, like we would normally say, and um, have the, the machine understand that. Um, knowledge, so tapping into the rich information graphs that we can get through the web and through other sources and be able to leverage that information uh, for additional intelligence. And then search capabilities. So um, there's a, a really great example out there. The uh, have you guys, have any of you guys seen Project Murphy? If not, go to projectmurphy.net and you can waste a whole afternoon just playing with Project Murphy. It's awesome. It's a little. Uh, let me just show you really fast. Let me see if it's working or no. Um, Project Murphy is this thing right here. So it's it's essentially a what if bot. And so what you can do is ask questions like. What if I were a Disney princess? And um, what it does is say, okay, there's me. So it, it's doing some parsing to figure out, all right, we're asking about you and a Disney princess. Then it's using the face APIs to uh, grab a picture. Oh no, internet. Is the internet not up? Okay. Maybe I won't show you. Well, we can come back to this one. But uh, essentially, oh, there it goes. That was weird. All right, I think we may have some internet issues today. Oh, no. All right, so in this case, oh, look at that. The ugliest sleeping beauty you've ever seen, right? So what it's actually doing is using the facial detection API. And so it, well, first of all, it's using the search, the image search API. So there's a Bing image search. So it parses this thing. It recognizes it's asking about what if I, so it's talking about me and it's talking about Disney princesses. It does a search for Disney princesses since it figured out that's what we care about. And then it got found a picture of Disney princesses. Then it's using the facial detection, cutting out my face in the picture of me that it took and then a Disney princess face and then superimposing them together. And it actually does some really neat stuff in addition to that. Like if my face is like face forward and it finds like a sideways tilting face, it'll actually use like the skin and like map it over onto that uh, dimension and stuff. So it's, it's some really neat uh, tech in there. But anyway, this is a very fun, I'll tell you where to get this app later. So I've wasted uh, way too much time just playing. What, what if I was Hermione? What if I was whatever? So a lot of fun there. So that's a great example of the search APIs. And then we have something new that was announced. I think it was Build last year. Uh, or was it Ignite? No, I think it was Build. Um, the, the Cognitive Services Labs. And so these are a great way to look at some of the, the research that Microsoft is doing. Because essentially, the story behind these cognitive services is that a lot of them are technology that we were using internally at Microsoft that some team has developed. And then someone got the brilliant idea, hey, why why don't we share this? This is actually kind of cool technology. Why don't we try to make a product out of this? And so it's somebody's job to actually kind of look through all these Microsoft research projects and figure out, okay, this looks like it might be a product. This looks like it could be a good product. And so some of these things are moving over slowly to uh, cognitive services. And so there's actually kind of a early look where they're putting some of these things out in labs where they're free. You can just try them out. You can play with them. You can see if they're useful. And then um, they may or may not uh, thing, but it's, it's a really neat playground to get early feedback and, and check out some new technologies. And there's a lot of stuff there around um, routing and like maps and routing and those kind of things in there. So if that's something you're interested in for your business, um, check out the, the what's in the labs right now. All right. 
And so here are the actual APIs. As I said, there's over 30 of them. So these are existing machine learning models that you can call and be able to get great information back. And um, the thing that I think is really cool about this is when you're talking about machine learning, the, the quality of how well it works is always the, the data that goes into it, right? So the, if you have like a wide variety of data, you can do a, a better job building things. And it's kind of like as a developer, I could write my own square root function, but why would I do that, right? There's a bunch of libraries out there that will calculate square root for you. So us as devs, probably nobody would sit down here and write a, a square root function. Um, we would call an existing thing in whatever language you were using. And so I think of cognitive services as kind of similar functionality, where there are some machine learning problems that are just so common, like facial recognition and stuff like that. I could build a facial recognition algorithm myself, but the variety of data, because uh, Microsoft has worked really hard to get data across ethnicities, across ages, across genders, um, and then use those all so you can probably get the best results from all of the data that Microsoft has at their disposal or, or any of the other big companies that are offering similar services probably are going to do a better job than, than if I sat and wrote one myself with the data that I personally have available, if that makes sense. So that's one of the reasons I think that, that services like these are really powerful because um, they're solving a, a common problem that a lot of us have. Okay, so then uh, these are all pre-built models. You call them and they get, and with, with a couple of exceptions, and those are our custom services. So let me call those out specifically. So there's a few uh, new services, the custom vision service in the vision field, the custom speech service in the speech field, uh, the Lewis service, uh, la uh, language understanding intelligence service um, under language, the custom decision service being custom search. And these are actually allow you to train with your own data. So if you want to have a customized speech service that works really well, uh, let's say I'm doing a drive through scenario and there's a lot of background noise and I want to optimize for words like happy meal, which may not be in a well that's probably in a common lexicon but um big mac maybe is, well that might even I, but other there may be other kind of weird terms uh baconator maybe baconator is not in a normal uh thing do you guys even eat baconators here or is that like an Amer that's totally an american thing oh my gosh <laughs> so um those kind of things uh you can see uh being really useful to have in a custom lexicon where you build it yourself so we're gonna take a look at the custom vision custom search and, and dive into those a little bit more and so in this talk i specifically want to focus on these I'm going to focus on vision and, and speech, uh, the majority of, for the rest of the talk. But I did want you to know all these other cool things are out there as well. All right. So then the question of why, let me just tackle that briefly before we uh, dive into some of these. Um, Microsoft has a variety of machine learning offerings. And so it can be really hard to figure out when do I use which one and what is the best fit. And so here's where I think the cognitive services really shine as opposed to Azure machine learning or as opposed to a deep learning framework like um, the CNTK or TensorFlow or some of these other things. These are really good for, for three reasons. So number one, they are so easy to code with. It is literally just like a really simple API call. And maybe like if I'm doing computer vision, for example, I just pass up a image and I get back all of this information. So really, really simple code. Um, and you just get a, a key and call it with your, your own key so it knows which um, essentially Azure subscription to associate billing with and you're, you're done. It's very simple. And then secondly, it's super flexible. So because this is just calling a REST endpoint, you can do it from any language, any platform. It could be Linux. It could be... Uh, whatever you want. And we actually have um, SDKs for doing this uh, in, in C. It depends on which cognitive service you're using, but most of them have support for a uh, an Android version, an iOS version, um, and some of them are Objective-C, some of them are Swift um, in the iOS world. Uh, uh, C Sharp, um, Node, Python, and Jupyter Notebooks. So there's a whole bunch of existing SDKs out there that have already wrapped up those REST calls um, into nice client libraries that just wrap the REST call for you. Um, but you can just, if, if it's another language, if you want to code in Ruby or something, you can just do that as well. It's just a REST call. 
And then finally, these are well tested. So again, I mentioned that a lot of these came out of Microsoft Research. So a lot of these things that have been released, we've been using for some of them for decades internally. So uh, and like the speech stuff is really incredible as well. When you think about uh, Microsoft set, set a record uh, last year in the speech domain, which is really, really exciting in December of last year. Um, XD, one of our uh, amazing uh, technical fellows at Microsoft, actually set, was able to beat the, so the big thing is a human, a human tra so for speech to text, a human professionally trained transcriber has a word error rate of approximately 5.6%. So that's what, over 90 or a little less than 95% accuracy. And uh, so with that word error rate, 5.6%, um, that's been kind of like the golden standard to beat. Can you beat a human? And in last December, Microsoft actually developed our, our speech to text got good enough that we actually beat and performed better than a human transcriber for the first time, which was really exciting um, in the field in general uh, to see things like that happening. And then finally, we have a bunch of really good documentation out there, sample code, uh, we monitor Stack Overflow, all of these things. So I think it's a, a great community all using these services too. All right, so how, show me some code. So here is how simple these things are to use. So this is a C-sharp version, but again, you can do this from many different languages. So if I wanted to call the computer vision API, for example, and let's say I have this image and I want to understand what is in the image, um, here is how you could actually do this. We have, uh, you create um, this, this set of features. So I'm just going to put together a collection of features. And I'm saying specifically, I only want the tags in the description. And the reason for that is there's actually a ton, like when you think about the face API and the vision API, there's actually a ton of data you can get back. So if you want to kind of scope that down and not use up so much bandwidth, you can actually say, I only want a subset. So just give me the tags in the description, for example. And then I'm just opening a new file stream. So that is converting my image right here into the stream of zeros and ones that it is stored as. And then I'm opening it up. And then basically I just call this analyze image uh, async, which passes in my stream of zeros and ones and then the features I want, which is just the tags and the description. And then under the covers, what this uh, SDK is doing is just translating that into a REST call. And it makes a call that looks something like this. And then what we get back is just a, a bunch of data. And I actually condensed it. You actually get back a lot more stuff than this, um, but I reduced it a little bit. Um, so I only included two tags. There were actually more tags that were returned, but you could see it returned outdoor. So it was uh, very confident, uh, not over 95% confident that this was an outdoor picture. And then bird. So it's noticed it was um, over 93% confident that there was a bird in this image. And then... Um, under description, we get all of the tags as well without a, uh, without a confidence level associated with, but you get kind of a list of tags as well as a caption, which tends to be a little phrase describing the picture. And in this case, this came back as a bird sitting on a branch which is pretty good. That is, in fact, what it is. So um, really, really cool stuff. And I will show you, you don't have to take my word for it. Uh, we actually, on our website, you can just go there and upload your own pictures and see the results that you get back. So you can try it out and kick the tires yourself if you'd like. All right, so let's dive into each of these, vision and speech. So let's start with vision. Uh, so there's a lot of different things within the Vision API. So there's it's kind of a whole category of services that are offered. And so inside of that, we have the, the Computer Vision API, which I showed you briefly on the following code example or the previous code, code example. We also have the Face API, um, the Emotion API, which kind of got uh, wrapped into the Face API. Um, we have a content moderator, which helps uh, moderate uh, uh, naughty content that maybe you don't want out on the internet. Um, and then we have our custom vision service, and I'll dive into that a little bit, as well as our video extractor, which I'll spend a little bit of time on as well. So here's computer vision specifically. It can do things like analyze an image like you guys just saw on the previous screen. You saw examples of it, you know, giving textual descriptions of what was actually in the image. It can perform OCR. That means optical character recognition. That is basically taking um, text inside of an image and being able to extract that digitally and recognize what the text is. Um, it can generate thumbnails, so uh, crop down images. And then we also have a celebrity recognition database, which is, you know, great if you want to, you know, f you know, hook it up with a face API and say, okay, what celebrity do I look most like? Ha -ha. And that's already been built like 20 times. So please don't go build that again, but you can if you want to. Um, 
And then we have um, an analysis of the image. So here's some of the other stuff that the computer vision API does return to you. So it returns the clip art type. We actually have an enumeration of different types of clip art that it gives you back. And in this case, this is not clip art, so it's zero. We also have a uh, line drawing, and I think that's a binary for whether it's a line drawing or not. And a line drawing is essentially like um, like a picture that you would see in a children's coloring book where it's just like a black outline on white, like a line drawing type thing. So it will recognize those. Um, it recognizes whether or not the image is black and white. And then it gives you information about the content. So you can see things like the tags that we saw before, uh, people swim. Um, we have a, actually a separate thing of categories as well as the tags that you see um, as well. Uh, we have uh, checks for adult content and, um, and raciness scores as well. Uh, the difference between um, is adult, there's actually two different things, is adult score and is racy. The difference between the two of those is the adult content is what you think it is. That's the, the really bad stuff. Um, is racy is something that is, uh, for example, like a woman in a bathing suit standing on a beach might be considered racy. So maybe not appropriate to show in certain cultures or, you know, in front of children or whatever, but not inherently you know, bad, just maybe someone could be a mom or something standing on a bathing suit. So just something to keep in mind. So you can use that information as long as well as the confidence scores uh, to determine what to show uh, to which audiences. And then we have facial recognition. So it will find the bounding box around the face. In this case, it's giving us uh, th that the, the bounding box, which allows us to draw that here is where the face is within the image. And then it can also estimate things like age and gender and things like that. It can give you hair color, all these other things. I'll show you a little bit more information in a second, as well as finding, uh, extracting information about the colors within the image. All right, and then um, optical character recognition. So in this case, what you see is some text that's embedded within an image. And that can be very difficult because if you do, uh, if you are, have a disability and kind of have accessibility requirements, there may be, this is just a picture, it's a JPEG, so it can't inherently read the text out of it because uh, it's, it's a picture. And so with, with OCR, you can actually extract that text by recognizing those characters. So in this case, you can see the JSON that our OCR API returns in this case, it gives you uh, the bounding box of where it finds text and then the bounding box of each individual word. So in this case, it found the word life right here. It found the word is right here and like, um, et cetera, et cetera. We also have an emotion API. The emotion API differentiates between eight different emotions. And it's pretty cool because it actually gives you all eight back every single time. So it's not like it returns the top emotion that he thinks it is. It actually returns, you know, all eight together, which is nice uh, because sometimes I have this great like half mad, half sad face that I reserve for my husband sometimes. And <laughs> my poor husband has no idea that there are so many jokes being made about him today. Um, but those kind of things, you actually see both of them embedded together uh, in the in these um, things. So you can see if there's like a mixture of emotions, you can actually extract all of that as well. So that is pretty cool. Um, we also have the face API. So it can recognize, so it can detect um, where a face is within an image. It can do facial verification. So given two faces, are these the same person or not? Um, it can do similar face searching and there's actually um, a boolean you can put on that which is the same person boolean so you can use similar face searching to say you know these are the same person yes or no or these people just have a similar face so if you use that you know in conjunction with the celebrity uh, database you can say that okay this face is very similar to you know some other face um, and then facial grouping so if you have a whole collection of faces being able to group together okay I think these are all the same person these are all the same person um, in a big category that's great if you're like labeling pictures to upload so you know okay these are all my daughter these are all my son that sort of thing and then facial identification allows you to train and recognize that okay this face is Jennifer Marsman's and then if I give it a new images of a face you can verify whether or not those are uh, Jennifer Marsman or not all right, and then facial detection, so that gives you the bounding box, so that looks something like this, where it figures out where the face is within the picture. And then I already mentioned that we also have all of these other characteristics, um, gender, uh, age, and such, and then grouping similar things together. And then if we applied the identification, we could actually get the identity of that person as well if he was trained in the system. So just to show you some of this, let me show you a couple things right here. 
Um, I want to show you, first of all, here's how to get to this good stuff. So um, the, the magic site to remember is microsoft.com slash cognitive. So if you go there, you can find just a whole bunch of information and you can try these things all out yourself. So if I go to microsoft.com cognitive and I'm going to, well, we're thinking about vision APIs right now. So inside of there, you can try out the computer vision API. You can try out the face API and see all the stuff that's there. So you can see examples of facial verification. And so you can use our sample data if you want and, and see, OK, these people are the same person or not um, and submit it and, and get confidence levels and such. Or you don't have to trust our sample data. You can hit browse and browse and upload your own pictures and try these things out yourself. Uh, which is uh, fun. And so here's an example with facial detection. And this shows you all of the information that, that is returned. So we have this uh, young woman right here. And you can see all of this data that comes back is, is pretty amazing. So we generate a, a GUID uh, with the face ID. And so that's uh, kept around temporarily, but then flushed. If you don't use it anywhere, it just goes away. Um, that's if you want to call back and say, OK, for this face, do something else. So it hangs on to it for a certain amount of time and then gets rid of it. We have the, the bounding box of the face, so that facial rectangle, and that's what allows us to draw this little box around our face. And then we now have attributes around hair. So we, we returned a zero for bald because she is not bald. Um, we have hair color, and it actually gives a variety of colors back. Um, and you can see the highest confidence here is, is brown, so we're pretty sure she has brown hair. Um, but it gives you a little bit um, of some of the other ones too. So if there's you know a touch of gray in there, it might tell you. Um, there's a, a number for smile that goes between zero and one. So you get the um, whee, number a one smile, a very bright smile, and then uh, kind of levels of calmness under there. And then the head pose, so the, the angle, the pitch roll and yaw that your, uh, your head is located at. And then the gender and age, um, facial hair, so mustache, beard, and sideburns. It will tell you if any of those things are present. Um, glasses. So this is actually an enumeration between four values. Glasses is, it will tell you if they're wearing reading glasses, like she is. Um, it will tell you if they're wearing um, sunglasses. It will tell you if the person is wearing no glasses, and it will also recognize swim goggles. We actually had swim goggles in our training set. So if you have a use case where you need to know if someone is wearing swim goggles, <laughs> we got you covered. <laughs> I still haven't found anyone who's been able to leverage that, but someone, hopefully that's useful to someone somewhere. And then now, uh, this was a, a newer edition. Um, it recognizes whether they're wearing makeup or not. Um, and then the emotions are in there too. So you can see she's a 0.9 on happiness. So it's primarily happy. And then there's some information about occlusion. If anything is partially covered, it'll tell you about that. There's accessories. There's blur level, exposure levels, noise levels. And then the 27 facial landmarks that are present for face identification. So the sides of the nose, the tip of the thing right here, right here. So all of those things, the XY coordinates for each of those landmarks are also given. So really, really cool. So I mean, all you do is write some code that, that sends up this picture and then you get this treasure trove of information back, uh, which is pretty cool. And so with that, you can do a lot of cool things. So I want to show you, you, who's familiar with the intelligent kiosk? Are you guys, have you guys heard about this yet? Oh, <gasps> you are in for a treat. Okay, so this is a whole collection of cognitive services demos. The code is all on GitHub. So all these things that I'm doing here, you can download them and you can play with it yourself. So you can go home and like start coding with this like now. Um, and you can, uh, I'll give you the link um, at the end for where you can download this. And then here when you download it, go under overview, is it? Yeah, overview here. And then it gives you the GitHub link embedded right in here. So here's where you can get the code on GitHub. It's uh, github.com slash Microsoft slash cognitive samples intelligent kiosk with some hyphens in there. And then this uh, this app is available from the Windows Store as well. So you can download this from the Windows Store, but it's called the intelligent kiosk. But I'll, I'll give you a link to it at the end. Um, that's a little easier to remember. So now, once you go in here, there's all of these really cool cognitive services demos, so examples of how to do this. And so here's one example. This is um, a real-time crowd insights. And so um, it can recognize me that there is a female in here in the thing that it has seen. It is a uh, whole, whole bunch of information. Can I, get, can I get a volunteer who doesn't mind having their age uh, estimated real quick? Anyone care? All right. Come on up, sir. 
All right, let's see if it can recognize that uh, that there's a male next to me here too. This is a live demo, so who knows? Who knows what could happen? Anything could happen. Yeah. So a 22, 32 year old male. So it actually recognized two different things because I guess the angle changed sufficiently that it estimated that you looked older or younger based on that. It's actually it's actually it's actually pretty interesting. Like oh, the, like oh, the oh, angle, nice. like right. Oh. Yeah, because it's working. Thank you very much. Thank you, gentlemen. Yes, wonderful. Look at that. Good stuff. Um, can I ask how old you really are? 44. Nice. So the, the kiosk likes you. Very nice. Yes, it's very nice. Um, but it is funny because what it's doing is essentially what we do as humans, right? We we create mental models in our heads of, you know, I've seen this person and I know how old they are and I know that this person's face and that they're approximately this old. And so you build up this model over time based on, you know, a labeled data set of faces you've seen and how old you know they are. Um, and so you can kind of estimate how old people are. But again, this is an estimate and I as a human am pretty bad at this. And so the machine can can is trying to do a similar thing, but again, it might make mistakes as well. And you can see when it thinks that it, when I jump between decades, um, it does actually do that, which is, uh, which is possible. Cause if you make like the, the millennial selfie face like that, yeah, twenties, twenties, baby, 25. Do you guys see that? 25. So, um, the selfie face does it every time. They're like, yeah, you're definitely young. Um, so you can see, you can see that, but what's really cool is it actually, this particular app is tracking demographic information. So at this point, um, it thinks it's seen, uh, three unique females. Cause I think it saw me, um, as a, as a 20 year old a couple times and I keep changing my face and changing the lighting by walking in under the light and then, uh, two distinct males. So when he jumped from his twenties to his thirties, it registered that as a different person as well. Um, but overall it does a really good job of, of narrowing down and, and the number of people that it thinks it sees and it's analyzed it's sending up um, an image once per second and so over time it's analyzed almost 70 faces now and it's found that only you know five of these are unique so it's combining those and keeping track of that and then right here it's actually keeping track of the average uh, crowd emotion so if there's a ton of people here um, it would actually keep track of average emotion over time by averaging together all of the emotions that were there now this is fabulous if you were doing something like usability testing right so if you're demoing you know your latest software product or something like that and you have a bunch of people who have consented to a usability test and so they're being recorded and such and you show a feature and they're like surprise or delighted or something like that you can capture that and programmatically map it up with where you were in your in your demo um, as well as uh, things like uh, you know disgust or oh they're not that happy those kind of things and so you can see if I'm mm, you can see my the overall level of the crowd right here is going down right so um, very interesting it does take a second because it's only uh, it's only sending to the cloud once per second. So there's sometimes a little lag. Um, and then there's actually the emotions too. Let me show you that one real quick because that one's fun. Is that still in here? Do, do, do. Emotion. This one. So I like the emotion photo booth. Let's see if this works with the microphone on me. So this one. I know, right? Yes, thank you, thank you. I'm ready for my award now, my acting, my fabulous acting award. So you can see how it recognizes these various um, emotions and can label them. And what it was actually doing is it's using the confidence levels as well. So there can be a big group of people here all doing this together. And if I display like a higher amount of happiness or if, some, if I had that gentleman come back up and he was able to look happier than me, um, it would overwrite this happy picture with a new you know, a stronger, happy thing. So it's, it's kind of an interesting thing, but you can see how it recognizes these different emotions. And this was trained with a bunch of data across genders, across ethnicities. Um, and so it, it does a pretty good job at recognizing these universal uh, emotions. Okay, so I'm gonna jump, there's, one, I think there was one more thing I wanted, was that everything I wanted to show you? Let me see. Let me jump back to my slides for a second. That's pretty good. So we saw we saw face, we saw emotion. I think we're we're pretty good there. Let's get to some other stuff. All right. 
the next thing, oh, the video indexer. So this is kind of cool. The video indexer is something that's a, a slightly newer cognitive service, but what's cool about it is that it actually combines a whole bunch of other already existing cognitive services into a way that makes it really easy to be able to uh, utilize um, videos and, and get a lot of good insights out of videos. So you upload your video and then it, it basically chugs on it and create, does a whole bunch of things. It extracts out, um, it does speech to text, it does, uh, it recognizes faces, it recognizes emotion, it does sentiment analysis. So let me just show, it's, it's all fabulous, but let me just show you. So this is what it looks like, but let me show it to you live. So if we go here, it's at vi.microsoft.com, so videoindexer.microsoft.com, and I'm going to jump there, and it's signed out, so I got to sign back in. Come on, internet. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to do actually sample videos um, because there's uh, this is actually a really cool thing. So if any of you guys have ever worked for a company and you can maybe afford because this this actually happens in my group sometimes there's you in your team you maybe choose like one or two people who get to go to build or something and they get to go that year and then they like share all the information and then kind of disseminate the information back to the rest of your team or your company or something so for things like that video the, this is awesome so take for example the build uh 2017 keynote so i'm gonna uh open this one up and so this is the video indexer and it's been run on the the 2017 build keynote and it did essentially all of these cognitive services so first of all great satya but i'm gonna interrupt you for a second um so it actually finds it's running the celebrity so it's 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 doing facial extraction first so it's finding all of the unique people who spoke during the day one um build 2017 keynote video which this is and then for each person so we have all the different speakers here and then for each person like scott guthrie for example it tells you so oh the other thing is it's doing a match on the celebrity uh database so like Scott Gu and I think Satya is in the yeah so Scott Gu or Satya is in the celebrity database so he has you can see his title and his biography and Bing and some other stuff pop up for celebrities that are recognized in the celebrity database um, but it actually shows here the percentage of the video so he actually appeared for 17 percent of the video and then it shows where in the video he was so he like did the kickoffs you can see he'd sell dark right here and then he jumped back on a couple times right there and then kind of uh scott uh guthrie took over and he was like all in here and then here's all the various demoers and they all have their own little demo screen and that's like the, where they showed up right OK, so you can see exactly where each person is present in the video and then you can jump just to that point if you want to. Um, so all of this stuff, so that's celebrity and it's facial pulling out and all of that kind of thing. The other thing it did was it ran um, speech to text on this. So it has a complete text transcript, which I'll show you in a second, and it pulled out the, the keywords. So here are the main topics that were discussed during this thing. So you can see that um, Azure Batch, for example, was discussed in the, the Microsoft Graph Common Data was a big thing. And so I can actually click on that keyword and it'll show me the next time they talked about the Azure Batch. Great. Okay. Thank you. So all of this great information that they were sharing. And then it actually has some annotations. So these are things using the computer vision API that it recognized. So it recognized people, it recognized standing, it recognized computer and monitor and indoor and man and floor. And <laughs> these are various things that it saw during the keynote. So not, not as useful for this particular video, but could be very useful depending on what video you're trying to process. Um, oh, and then the speech sentiment shows up here too. So you can see that um, this particular keynoter was very, very positive. Um, not that many negative things were said, which is probably a good thing. And then the other thing, so that's just some of the insights. So you can see it's just like running cognitive service after cognitive service on all these videos and then pulling out a lot of great information. And then the other thing is the transcript. So right here, you can see a complete uh, transcript. I can search for things in the transcript. So what was it, Azure Batch maybe, if that was important, I can search for that. And then I could go to this thing and jump right to this area. And there's Scott Goo talking about it. And I can jump back to the transcript. And so it does live jumping to the right place in the transcription as well as you read this. 
So really, really cool. So this is actually incredible. If you have ever been Jennifer Marsman and you're watching the keynote and you're like, oh my gosh, I just want to jump to the machine learning part of it and skip everything else. <laughs> um, you can actually take something like this and then type in your keywords and like kind of jump around in the keynote and really focus on, okay, there was this really cool demo on this. Let me just jump, you know, find it right in here and that sort of thing. So anyway, this is just, it's an amazing service. You can try it out. vi.microsoft.com um, will redirect you. You can also do video indexer.ai will get you there as well. But amazing. You can up learn your own videos get started today it's really fun okay and useful I think all right next thing um so a case study so um uber is one example of someone who is actually using our facial verification api today um it within uber everyone they have uber in sweden right I thought you did okay so um do you guys have lyft you don't have lyft here right not Lyft, but okay. Well, Uber, so ride sharing service, right? So um, there's a pilot that was rolled out in the U.S. where an Uber driver, when they register with Uber, they, you know, have some background checks done and stuff like that. And there's a picture and that's the picture that shows up when you call for an Uber. You know, you see the image of your driver and stuff come up and that sort of thing. And so one problem, though, that Uber was concerned about is if... I go through, if I want to be an Uber driver and I go through the background checks and maybe I'm okay and I pass all the background checks, but then um, maybe I just want to go take a nap for a while and I want to hand my phone to my sister and let my sister drive for me for a while so she can make some extra money and she hasn't gone through the background check or anything like that. So that's not a good thing. We don't want her to be driving for me. And so um, what they've done is they actually have the Uber drivers are required. Occasionally it'll pop up a thing and say that take a selfie. And so then they have to like take a picture of themselves using the camera on the phone. And then it verifies that picture against the picture that's, that are on file um, of the Uber driver to ensure that the person driving is in fact the person that um, is, is registered to drive. And it will say if like the lighting is bad or something, it'll say or it'll say like remove your glasses or some other things. So sometimes it'll take a, a few pictures, but it actually tells you what to do like oh move this lighting or move closer to the picture or stuff it actually gives you nice hints too so there's a video on this and a full case study if you'd like to read more information I'll give you the the slides with the links but it does protect the um both the drivers as well as the um the, the end customers and the drivers from getting their their accounts hacked as well all right, and then the other example that's kind of interesting is Gray Meta. So I hadn't heard of them before, but they had kind of an interesting problem. They manage uh, large media things and a big problem with this. So they have all this like video and such that they're trying to manage. And one of their issues was, um, let's say I need a picture or I needed a short video for this thing that we're running of someone... Um, you know, singing with a rubber ducky in a bathtub or something like that. So some kind of silly thing that, oh, I need this for this campaign or whatever. And what they, what was happening with some of these uh, media companies was that they were actually um, reshooting film because they could not find it. They're like, I know we have this huge archive and big library of stuff, but it was so hard to find the right thing when they needed it that sometimes they would actually just reshoot and it was easier to just reshoot then and get somebody else doing a stupid little bathtub thing then to find the, the the content that they had already created so they were using the cognitive services here in the computer vision api to be able to recognize and tag all their things to make it easier to say okay i need something of brad pitt or i need something with a bathtub or whatever and be able to get the the content that they needed so there's <laughs> it's James's fault. It's all James's fault. <laughs> okay. So then the custom vision service is next. Um, so custom vision is very cool because uh, we have our computer vision API, right? And the computer vision API is wonderful because it recognizes that this is a computer and this is a woman and this is a desk or whatever. But if you are working on a plant floor and you have an assembly line and maybe you want to do sorting and if it's a car company, maybe the windshield wiper blades need to go over here and this part, I'm sorry, I don't know the parts on cars, but let's say some other part needs to go this way. So we have these different distinct parts that are going to different places um, and we might not be able to recognize, you know, this part versus that part that's specific to your manufacturing line. So that's where custom vision comes in. You can use this and train it on your own data and then be able to differentiate between kind of your own things. So build a classifier to distinguish between maybe various parts or different makes of a um, uh, 
service or different kinds of cars for at a car dealership or something like that. So here's how you do it. You actually just, it's so easy. I'll show you in a second. But you just upload your images. You hit train and it trains on the custom vision service and then uh, you can call it um, using, again, it's, it's exposed via a REST endpoint. So again, you can call it from any, um, any language, any platform. And then you can use active learning. So it'll actually help you make it better. So when it mislabels things, you can relabel it for you and it will actually say to you, okay, here's, if you label these things for me, this will help me the most because these are the things I'm most confused about. So it makes the best use of your time actually manually labeling because it'll give you the things that'll give it the most bang for the buck. So let me, so here's kind of the quick example for how it would work. First of all, during the training phase, I pass in a whole bunch of images of cats, labeled cat, and a whole bunch of images of dogs, labeled dog, into the custom vision service, and it uses that to produce a model. So that's the training part, right? Then um, when I actually want to execute it, um, I do the same thing, except I call my model now standing up at that rest endpoint with an unlabeled image of a, of a dog, for example. So I send it an unlabeled image, and then it will be able to pass back to me dog or cat, whatever that label is. Okay. So that's how custom vision works. Um, and we just announced at Ignite um, last year, actually, or actually right before Ignite, uh, so a couple months ago, um, that we have the ability to export things uh, to mobile as well. So it works on I, um, iOS 11 today using the Core ML functionality in iOS 11. And then uh, we have support for Android coming very, very, very soon. And so there's a sample of how you can do this online, um, which is great code that kind of basically has the iOS app written for you. And then you just stick in your own custom labels. And then the camera on the phone will recognize and pop up a little uh, thing. I did a demo of this at Ignite. I had different pieces of fruit and I trained a fruit classifier. And then um, as I held the camera over each piece of fruit, it would just pop up the kind of fruit it was. So let me show you a couple examples of that. So I want to first show you the custom AI site and how you would build one of these. So here is customvision.ai. And I might have to sign back in. I think it's probably confused with what. And I want to use for custom vision, I want to use this account. Yay for auth. We're so secure. <laughs> All right. So um, here's an example of a couple different classifiers I've built. And let me show you how to build a new one. So to create a brand new project, all you would do is click new project. Um, this is my demo right here. And then here are the different domains. So if you have a certain domain, like I know this is food, I know this is whatever, you can actually give it a hint and then it will, um, it will, kind of use a different, um, basically it's doing transfer learning. So it's figuring out where on the neural net to cut it off and start building from. And so if you do want to do um, something that will be, that you could run on a, on a phone, on a mobile device, um, choose this compact one, this general compact one, and then that will be able to be exported to um, Android and iOS. So I'm going to hit create project on that. And then um, it says, okay, it gives me this nice little workspace. So then it says, you don't have any images, add images. So you can click it here or you can click it here. And then I just go through and grab some images on my machine. And in this case, I have this whole directory of fruit. And so I have apples, bananas, coconuts, all these different things that I trained before. So I'm just going to control A to select all of the different uh, images there and hit open. Those are all my apples, examples of apples. And so there's uh, 124 there, and I'm going to label those all as apple. And you can give multiple labels too, so I could call it fruit as well or something if I wanted to. And then I'm just hit upload on all of those files, and it will start uploading. And then I'm going to pull a Julia child because I don't want to wait for it. And I'm going to open uh, this in another thing as well. And then here's my uploading one. I can jump to one that's already built. So here's my crew classifier. Here's a dog cat classifier. I built this one as well. And so this one you can see I trained with um, 37 images of cats. And I can select that to show you just the cats. And then uh, 45 images of dogs like so. And then um, I can actually, you just click train. So after they've all been uploaded, you click this to train it. I've already trained it, so let me just run a quick test. And what I'm going to do is go to an image. I was actually kind of a punk, and I went to Bing image search, and I searched for dogs that look like cats to see if I could fool it. 
and I downloaded this um, Sheba dog and you can see it's got kind of the curly tail that kind of looks like a cat and it's got the pointed ears that kind of look like a cat so I'm gonna test using this guy and so there's my dog and it came back with the tag dog yay so it did actually figure out that that was a dog um, so really really cool stuff that you see you can build here so that's kind of how you can build it and then after you've done that you can get the prediction API or, or the URL to actually call it on the rest endpoint right here so you go to performance click prediction URL and it tells you exactly if you have an image that's on the web somewhere call it like this and if you have a local file that you're working in the file system call it like that and then bam and that's exactly how you call it very easy all right so let me show you one other example so the the intelligent kiosk actually has an example here they have this custom vision explorer demo um, and it actually that he created um i didn't write this one this is um they created three different uh, examples so there's a traffic conditions one where it's trained on uh, heavy uh, moderate and light traffic there's a vehicle one that can distinguish between vehicles and there's also a weather conditions one so I could do a search here for something like Seattle weather and see what we get back oh yeah nice okay so I could select something like this and see how it does and yes we are 83 percent rainy in seattle so a uh, great example where it, it we trained it using cloudy rainy uh snowy stormy and sunny and then i can add a new image that was not in the training set and get uh, fairly good results so um that is custom vision um where you can create your own things okay so now let's jump back to the slides for a second and uh, let me tell you a little bit more about custom vision. So when you're using custom vision, you should use at least 30 to 50 images per tag. So if I'm trying to distinguish between, you know, maybe three different things, do at least three, uh, 30 to 50 per thing that you're trying to distinguish between. Um, secondly, the images should be the focus of the picture. Uh, so for example, if I wanted to train it to recognize dogs, you want a picture where it's it's mainly of the dog. You don't want a picture of me walking a dog with a big Ferris wheel in the background, like all this extra stuff, like just focus it right on the dog. Um, make sure that you're using diverse images and uh, different backgrounds like I, I actually just did a Bing image search for dogs and cats to get a variety of breeds they were a variety of different positions and angles some of them were laying on their backs and uh, sitting and standing and running and eating and all kinds of different uh, different pictures I um, mean you also want to do something where you don't like um, if I put all of my cats on a red background for example and all of my dogs on a blue background the algorithm doesn't know inherently and that you're supposed to be focusing on the animal right so it might accidentally build a red versus blue classifier to distinguish between those two rather than a cat versus dog classifier does that make sense so you you want to vary everything um other than what you're what you're trying to recognize so that it sees different examples of that but it might get confused and build a red versus blue versus classifier if you did something like that so make sure you're using a variety of backgrounds and things like that too and then also train with images that are similar in quality and resolution and stuff to things that you're going to use in production. So I actually did some work with uh, image recognition using uh, with a drone and I changed what drone I was using. I started and I trained a model with this drone. Um, it was an older like parrot drone and um, it had a lower resolution camera and then my manager bought me a nicer drone and so I started using that drone and my my old um, the the algorithm that I had built didn't work very well because it had trained with all these lower resolution pictures of me and then the new drone was doing higher resolution pictures so it's, it's very different so you know use similar quality and resolution and lighting to the things that you're actually going to be testing against later and this does support Microsoft accounts as well as um, Azure Active Directory um, in custom vision the version that is out right now does not do um, object detection so if you have a picture of me walking a dog with a ferris wheel it's not going to recognize the dog inside of the image right it's it's for classification between different things not for object detection all right um the other thing is why this is really really cool is because in typical deep learning you actually you need thousands of images and thousands of examples of each kind of tag to be able to do something cool and with custom vision they made it possible to do it with like 30 or 50 and that's what's really incredible about this technology um, but as a as an artifact of that it's kind of robust to more subtle differences so things like defect detection might not work well so for example if I wanted to do like 
an iPhone and an iPhone with a crack in the screen and I wanted to recognize whether there were cracks in the screen, probably wouldn't be able to do that, right? Because the um, what makes it generalize well across and be able to use less data does not make it good at picking up little differences like here's a phone, here's the exact same phone with a tiny crack in it. Does that make sense? I'm, I'm seeing some nods. Yes, let me know if that doesn't make sense. Um, and then there's some limitations while it's in preview as well. Okay. So a couple scenarios um, for customer support. That's a really good thing um, because it allows you to just like take a picture. So imagine I want to do support for my, I don't have my manual because I always lose my manual, but I want to do support on my washing machine and I don't want to pull out the whole washing machine and look in the back and try to find the serial number because it's heavy and I will break something and it's crazy. But if I could just instead take a picture of that washing machine and have it automatically find the manual online, that would be awesome, right? And that'd be a great service for, for a, a big manufacturer to provide. Um, service engineers could use it. Again, take a picture and be able to order the appropriate part, that sort of thing. Um, manufacturing, I, I hesitate to put this in because of what I said before, um, but you could potentially use it for some fault detection, but only not if it was a subtle thing, like a crack in a screen, it wouldn't pick up. But if it was like, here's a part, here's a part broken into lots of pieces, it might be able to differentiate. I think it'd be able to differentiate between those, but just not, um, if it's very subtle, it, it wouldn't, it may not work. And then finally, for data scientists, this is great for labeling your data. Like if I had all this fruit data and I was doing a study on, I don't know, fruit over time or things like that, I might want to use like all this fruit as input, but I might need a nice labeled data set if these are all, you know, this type of fruit. So I could use this to actually label all my data and then be able to use that for a different machine learning project. So that's, um, that's really powerful. All right, so here's all the resources, customvision.ai. There was a great uh, chalk talk that they did at Build last year where they went through the SDKs and you can program everything that I was doing on the website, you can do from code as well. There's programmatic access to, to all of it. And that's all on GitHub too. And uh, Python and Node SDKs are coming if they're not out already. All right, so now let's do speech. Um, so speech is pretty simple. We have a Bing speech API, speech attacks text to speech. We have a speaker recognition to differentiate between speakers and then custom speech as well. So let's look at each of those. So I'm just going to show you speech first by have you guys, did anyone know about dictate.ms? Because this has been like a little treasure that I is like my new best friend. So dictate.ms, if you go to dictate.ms, you can download this add-in for office and then I'm going to open, so this works in any Office product. I could do it in PowerPoint. I'll do it in Word just so that you can see it a little better. Um, but it works in um, in PowerPoint. It works in Outlook, so you can dictate emails like this. It's beautiful. I can just sit at my desk and, like, talk to my screen and it just writes it all down. But let me show this to you. So it, it gives you this add-in, this dictation tab. So add, uh, install the add-in. You get this dictation tab. And now I can just start talking. Oops, Sorry. Four score and seven years ago, our forefathers brought forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Not bad, right? <laughs> Okay, let me stop it. Um, so pretty cool, right? Um, really neat stuff. So this has been just for productivity. Oh my gosh, I use this with Outlook all the time. I'm like, I can talk my email or speak and get emails written for me. It's fabulous. So speech to text, that's how it works. Then we also have speaker recognition. So here's an example of that. If you go again to back to the great uh, cognitive website, so microsoft.com, WAC Cognitive, we'll get you there. And then click on speech. Um, and you can see a whole bunch of demos, but here's an example of the speaker recognition. And we actually trained um, a classifier to differentiate between um, six U.S. presidents. We actually wrote this before the election, so the latest president is not in there. Uh, and there's uh, audio for each of these. And so we trained it on like their inauguration speech, right? Or, or for one specific speech. And then here's snippets that are not from the speech that we trained on. And so you can see the results here. If I run this audio clip and then right here, it'll give you the results of who it thinks is speaking. So if I run clip one. And that is Obama. All right. And then we can do clip two.
and you can see it right in for that is George W. Bush. And then I think the George Bushes sound very, very similar. But if you do the other George Bush, too, it actually got the book. It separated them, which I thought was impressive. Yay. And then Clinton, is he's got a pretty distinctive voice. So, yeah. So anyway, all of this works. So you can see it actually identified who the speaker was. So that can be really cool. Like, imagine if you do this with your, your call and support center and you can recognize um, the different um, support agents and how, the, you know, how well um, each of them are doing or how you can best help them or, you know, different strategies that they have that are most effective or find the speech patterns of the people that seem to be getting the best survey results or all kind of great stuff there. So a lot of cool stuff you can do there. So that's the speaker recognition um, part of it. Um, and then I showed you this as well. So yeah, speaker recognition and um, speech to text. Good stuff. All right. And then the last thing I want to cover is the custom speech service. And so what this is, is much like the custom vision. Um, this allows you to customize something for your specific domain. So imagine I'm in the medical field and I'm a doctor. And uh, I all I know about the medical field is what I get from the you know doctor TV shows. So, you know, give me 50 cc's of uh, pentasa or what's the prednisone or you know some of these drugs that I don't I don't know what they do um, but these kind of things may not be in a common lexicon right they in a speech-to-text average dictionary they may not be recognizable and so you can actually customize two different things a language model for here are the different things that are discussed in our world like we have a lot of um, met names of medicines and things like that uh, that may be discussed and then the acoustic model so if you're operating in an environment that has a lot of background noise and stuff you can actually train it specifically for that environment to get better results um, so, and that's what I just said. Okay, so here's, let me show you how you do it because that's the, that's the fun part. So a lot of different things you could do for hands-free. If you're um, a plant floor type environment in a manufacturing field, this can be really powerful. Um, Drive-throughs, uh, worked with uh, fast food drive through restaurants where there may be like a radio playing in the background of the car or kids screaming in the back seat because they're hungry or whatever, being able to account for that background noise. And then call centers are another great example. All right, so here's a code sample. So we actually have some uh, example data that you can use to try this out yourself um, that is related to biology. So I can show this uh, data to you real quick. And um, I mentioned there's you know the language model as well as the acoustic model. So let's see, I had that in GitHub. So it would be under C code here, here, here. Okay, so here's what the data looks like. For the language model, all you need to pass in is basically here's uh, examples of the language. So you don't need the audio things, but you can see this data is biology data. So it's um, information about life forms in the Mesozoic and Jurassic periods, I believe is what this is. And so you can see a lot of interesting uh, data here, um, all kinds of, you know, words that, you know, Paleozoic, um, uh, all these other things th that may not be discussed in, in a common lexicon. So I can give it examples so that it knows the kind of language that will be used. And then you can also build an acoustic model. And acoustic models require two things. They require, first of all, the, the audio. So I can grab like one of these audio files and play it. Can you guys hear that OK? It's a little, can you, is it, can you turn it up or no? No? OK. Well, it's a, um, this is a, um, So he said something like, where is Pantera Vegris Degata native to? <laughs> um, and I can actually see by going to the transcription. So these are a whole bunch of just audio files. And then here under the transcriptions, it gives me, okay, for this file, he actually said, where is Panthera Tigris Vergata native to? All right. So those kind of, those kind of things. So um, you can actually build a model using that. So if I go to uh, Chris.ai, nope. That's not it. Where's my Chris? Here's my Chris. So um, with, with custom vision here, um, I, I created a couple of things. So I first you upload all that data and create custom models. And you have to re-log back in. And so here's our custom data. So I uploaded that acoustic data um, as well as the language data, which is just the text. And then I built some models. So you go to acoustic models and language models, and you can build each of the models. And then it gives you the base models that you can use. So you can um, derive from other language and then be able to add on. Here's these other uh, terminology that we use in our lexicon. And then you can run some accuracy tests. So this is what I really want to show you is the accuracy tests. So 
if I start at the bottom here, here's just using a base regular acoustic model with the just the language model so adding in kind of that that the, that text only and you can see the word error rate so you want a lower word error rate is better um is is about 10 percent which is pretty good and then if we train it here with just a normal language model so we're not telling it you know the specific terminology we use but we do give it like the background noise and the acoustics here um you can see we got a word error rate of about 33 percent and then finally, if we use both the acoustic model and the language model together, um, we got a word error rate of 2.86%, which is really good. So just by training it with your specific to your specific acoustical environment as well as your specific language, you can get really good results. So another or one last example of that is the, do I have the airport kiosk demo? I thought I already had it open. Here we go. Airport kiosk demo. I must have closed it. Okay, so this is an example of um, some language that is in an airport and then being able to um, figure out, you know, what is the, uh, or try to make it better. So this is a kiosk in an airport. So a lot of background noise in an airport, but you can walk up to it, ask questions and get results. And it also was fine tuned for language that may be used in an airport. So for example... All right, so you could see that in the baseline, it did still did a pretty good job, but it didn't quite get Pittsburgh, but it was able to map that to, in fact, this is using a Lewis intent on the back end too, uh, which I'm not talking about today, but um, you can see it did a pretty, it, it, it actually had higher accuracy right here um, with, in the custom model, and it did recognize Pittsburgh right there and a little bit more information. And then let me just grab another one. I'm not sure what, air bibs maybe? All right. So in this case, it said, "What certain aircraft service uh, plate for 59?" Because <laughs> it, th you know, was assuming four, which makes sense most of the time. But in this case, what sort of aircraft serves flight 459? Because it understands that we say flight and give flight numbers in this in this lexicon a lot. So really, really cool stuff. And this was all done based on Chris to make it something that was specific and could really empower you in a in that kind of an environment. Okay. So I think that is just about everything we've seen. Um, We've, I've tried to cover a lot here. Um, you could see, we saw the biology data, we saw the accuracy tests, and then we saw the airport kiosk right there. So in summary, we covered, we got through kind of these vision APIs and the speech APIs. I tried to call out some of the important stuff. Um, I'm going to give you a link in just a second to that uh, intelligent kiosk so you can see all the code for all those great cognitive services demos. But hopefully you've got a sense for what you can do with these. How many people learned at least one new thing? Awesome. Cool. And I did my job. Here's some additional resources. Um, the website that I mentioned, uh, Microsoft.com Wet Cognitive is is great. Um, the user voice. So if you want to give feedback on the cognitive services or request um, a certain language, maybe Swedish, uh, get in there faster. You can do that at um, cognitive.uservoice.com. And then if someone else already has it, just keep upvoting it because they we do actively look at that, and the things that are upvoted the most tend to get uh, answered the fastest. And then there's a Stack Overflow tag, Microsoft.cognitive. Uh, and then the um, Ignite contents there. And then I didn't give, let me make, let me just add this right here. The other thing is that intelligent kiosk demo is available at a, um, HTTP comma wack wack, aka dot ms intelligent, no, it's actually kiosk app is where you download it. It's kiosk app is the download right there. And then you can get the, um, the rest of it from there. You can, the link is embedded into the app. So aka dot ms kiosk app will get you that all that um, fun app you can download the app and then uh, play with the code all right I'm letting all the cameras take take their pictures all right thank you